I started my career in uh, marine biology and fishery science in Eritrea, um, and I had a slightly unhealthy obsession with uh, a very beautiful ornamental fish called uh, orange face butterfly fish. Uh, and I had the immense pleasure of um, collecting um, hundreds of specimens from the Red Sea, dissecting them, taking out the gold, embed in, um, in wax, slice them. So um, that's how my journey started to sort of looking at the spawning seasonality of uh, this beautiful ornamental fish called orange face butterfly fish. I'm not terribly proud of that, but uh, that was a, a great experiment working back then. Uh, doing a research in fishery science and marine biology. However, later on, I was increasingly uh, getting more and more interested in um, and the human side of the story, um, looking at the, the human nature uh, interaction. And um, that's what motivated me afterwards uh, to make a slight shift in focus from the pure biological marine biology and fishery science uh, focus towards that uh, interface between uh, uh, human behavior uh, and nature. Um, and that has primarily shaped my uh, career, if you like, for the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, so today, uh, taking this opportunity, uh, I wanted to share some slides and uh, some thoughts, uh, which I've it's titled at the moment as um, Towards a Shared Blue Prosperity Under Changing Climate. Uh, but just before I do, just quickly about World Fish. World Fish is a, a research um, institute, part of the CJR wider network. And our mission states that we want to see an inclusive world of healthy, well nourished people and a sustainable blue planet now and in the future. And uh, our vision is uh, to end hunger and advance sustainable development by 2030 through science and innovation transform food, land and water systems with aquatic foods for healthier people and planet. And therefore, hopefully you understand uh, uh, the focus of my intervention today is primarily going to be uh, looking at uh, the ocean health and aquatic uh, environments through um, the food lens. And these are sort of the countries where we work in at the moment. Uh, so, um, every time we talk about climate change, why is it so important that we talk about aquatic foods as well? So what's at stake? As we all know, aquatic food systems support more than 3 billion people uh, um, uh, with their source of food for billions of people, and um, they create uh, millions of employment opportunities, particularly for small-scale food producers, half of whom are women, particularly if you look at the entire supply and value chain. Um, but also, in, in addition to uh, the coastal uh, wild capture fisheries, equally important as well is the aquaculture side of the story as well, uh, which is almost on a 50-50 partner with wild capture that is projected to significantly grow over the next decade or two as well. So, so many developments in this space. Um, but how is climate change affecting the aquatic food system? So, of course, there are multiple um, impacts of, the, um, of climate change on aquatic food systems, be it due to temperature rise or sea level rise, increasing salinity, ocean acidification. I think many of us have heard of these sort of biophysical change that happen uh, in the aquatic environment, be the ocean or lakes or rivers. So the change in these biophysical change uh, characteristics of water affects the way the fish breed, the way they reproduce, the way they grow. Um, uh, and uh, but also what's also equally important is in terms of you know how they affect our infrastructure that supports the aquatic food system as well, be it our jetties. Uh, or other facilities, particularly in the coastal uh, areas. And therefore, the impact of climate change on aquatic food systems cannot uh, be understated. And uh, this is um, uh, from a study from the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. 
And uh, what they find is further sort of, you know, strengthening the point about, you know, this, the poleward shift in the distribution of some fish. What that means is that as the water becomes warmer in the tropical areas, what we're increasingly seeing is for a number of fish stocks or fish populations migrating to cooler environments, which makes it very difficult for small scale food producers to pursue the fish, mainly because it's economically um, and technically prohibitive to pursue the fish, to follow the fish as it goes up um, northwards or south, for that matter, whatever the cooler environment is. And therefore, those that are mainly impacted are across the uh, tropical areas um, and the uh, low latitude uh, countries or regions, which we all know as well is um, home to millions of people living in poverty as well. So that sort of the disproportionate impact when it comes to the impact on aquatic food system is really is really pronounced in uh, the low uh, latitude uh, regions or countries. And this is um, a study that we've just completed and submitted to Food Nature, um, which is currently under review. Is uh, we we looked at you know which countries uh, will be facing what sort of risk or or challenge as set with climate change, and of course, um, which is not surprising to many, is we we conclude that by 2100 all countries will face high or very high hazard scores or higher risk to uh, climate change, uh, uh, particularly from marine and freshwater fisheries and freshwater aquaculture in particular as well. Nonetheless, if you look at the heat map here, the vector map here, those darker areas are the ones which much higher risk. Those are rated as very high risk. And therefore, again, if you look at those, there are sub-Saharan African countries, there are the Caribbean and Latin American countries, and they are in uh, Southeast and South Asia. So again, these are sort of the regions where there's a higher concentration of, uh, um, of uh, people living in poverty. Similarly, a few years ago, we did a study purely from an economic point of view. How will the impact of climate change affect uh, uh, um, profit or sort of projected revenue and profit from uh, fisheries and aquaculture in uh, developing countries as opposed to the high income countries. Again, if you look at the gray curve here uh, in the low, among the low income countries, that's uh, going due south. Um, again, that shows that, you know, potential fish landing and profits in low income countries are projected to decline. Um, so this is for me, more worrying in the sub-Saharan African context, because according to other projections from the World Bank as well, um, while we will see a growing demand uh, in consumption and production of aquatic foods more broadly across the globe, even the global developing countries, but Africa seems to lag behind. So it's the only region, the sub-Saharan African region, where we will see or witness a decline in per capita consumption of aquatic foods. And this further, you know, exacerbates things in addition to climate change, but also there are a number of other institutional challenges as well. For example, if you look at Senegal, for instance, you know, one of the fish species or fish stocks that's targeted by low income groups in Senegal is sardinella. You know, those canned uh, tin sardines that we all consume. And uh, there, there are two, primarily two types of salmon species uh, of the coast of uh, Senegal and the Gambia, etc. And these are have very limited threshold to any kind of temperature change. And as a result, what we're seeing is an alarming rate of migration of these fish species towards cooler environments. And therefore that's affecting the ability for Senegal to capture sardine. And for me, sardine in this particular case is extremely important because it's one of those affordable small fish, highly nutritious, rich in omega-3 and a number of other um, nutritional uh, values is disappearing in front of our eyes. Um, but to make things worse, what we see booming in Senegal at the moment uh, is the fish meal industry. 
the fishmen industry, what it does is it just hovers up the the sea, uh, the fish, and uh, and it processes it and converts into powder, and that powder is shipped to aquaculture uh, farms, be it in Thailand or in Norway or wherever they may be, to produce more fish that may not necessarily be consumed by low income groups. So this is sort of been a very alarming trend that we see in addition to climate change, but also this, these ill informed short term, uh, the person of the short term gains that we see in the decision making process that makes things worse. So yes, climate change, huge threat, but also the the decisions that we make in terms of how we sustainably use and manage our resource also going, seems to be exacerbating the, the problem. Now, enough with the problems. So let's talk about the solutions very briefly and quickly. Um, uh, so in terms of the solutions, of course, I think there's a growing interest that has always been so, but now there's a growing momentum on um, the on marine protected areas, for instance, uh, or the limiting certain areas of the ocean or the water body as no take zones. And there is a movement uh, 30 by 30, which is really exciting. It's going to be hugely useful uh, for marine life and protecting biodiversity and hopefully protecting people as well. But just to play the devil's advocate here, I've just decided to ask that question, does size matter? And the reason why I'm saying this is that if you look at uh, the world map, this is purely from an ecological connectivity point of view. We presented this at the United Nations a couple of years ago as part of the ongoing negotiations uh, uh, on the governance of uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, so if you look at these coastal countries from the least developed countries, their coastal waters are highly interconnected with waters that are hundreds if not thousands of miles away from them because that's how nature operates and um, for example if you look on the right hand right hand side and you look at Somalia for instance its water bodies are highly interconnected with the water bodies of Eritrea and the Red Sea and also but as far as you know Oman and Bangladesh and India and Madagascar. So this is like a small country in the Horn of Africa, but this huge connectivity in terms of the water body. This is a very fascinating study, actually. What we do is normally we drop virtual rubber ducks in the in our virtual ocean and we track in you know, how long does it for the rubber, how long does it take for the rubber duck to travel certain distances and where would it end up due to the ocean circulation, ocean currents, and a number of other complex systems. And this, we generate these maps just to demonstrate that these are highly interconnected systems, right? And why is this so important? Why am I talking about this? The reason I'm talking about this is because it's critically important to understand where we protect. Because in most of the, uh, the discussions that we're having at the moment, uh, the discourse or the narrative at the moment is we look at those biologically and ecologically significant areas, which is extremely important. But also, I think we need to add that element of the socioeconomic benefit as well. Uh, for instance, you know, if you identify a certain area as a as a biodiversity hotspot, but also looking at which areas can deliver biodiversity benefits, but at the same time can also deliver benefits to certain parts of the world, particularly those areas where there is higher concentration of uh, people living in poverty. And therefore, I think understanding the sort of the, this kind of interconnectivity or the connectivity of the ocean to inform our decision making in terms of identifying areas for protection. Let's say, for instance, 30 percent of the ocean. For me, I'll be the happiest in that if we protect more than 50 percent or 60 percent of the ocean. But that's not politically palatable. Let's set it for 30. But where will those 30 percent be? So as we do so, I think what's really important is to identify biodiversity hotspots, but also areas where we can see uh, some poverty alleviation benefits alongside with that as well. Uh, continuing <clears throat> uh, talking about solutions, uh, you know, addressing the impacts of climate change. Uh, one of the slightly provocative points I'm keen to make today is to start thinking beyond resilience. For me, the discussion around adaptation resilience is really good, but I think it has limited my opinion in terms of our ambition and aspiration in terms of the change we want to see. 
and therefore what really needs to be done is to aim for a shared blue prosperity that includes putting aquatic food systems on the low emissions pathway, building resilience of aquatic ecosystems, building prosperous livelihoods, but also strengthening our infrastructure with a number of um, the um, enabling environments around it. For example, a simple example is you can build resilience of fisher communities, for instance, by enhancing their ability to anticipate climate hazard. For instance, as simple as having a climate information service in a, a forecast of some sort that tells me tomorrow there's going to be a storm or tomorrow there's going to be a temperature spike and therefore it's going to affect your fish farm uh, by such and such uh, and therefore you have to do X, Y and Z, which is the advisory system. And astonishingly, the majority of small scale producers in particular do not have access to these kind of uh, climate information services. Uh, I'm happy to share with you a good news that really came out, came out this week or recently actually the last couple of weeks is we have harnessed this digital solution as an opportunity and we've do, designed an app, a system that would work primarily in Bangladesh to begin with, which will show you know to any fish farmer what are the unprecedented sort of you know um, temperature hikes or or a number of other biophysical changes that may happen in the next five days and at the same time it offers the advisory system what the fish farmer needs to do to mitigate that as well and we're hoping to reach to a hundred thousand or more fish farmers by the end of this year and hopefully if this is widely disseminated at least that will give the fish farmers the ability to be able to predict and to take action in mitigating those uh, unprecedented weather events as well. And similarly with mitigation as well, again, working on these digital solutions, we try, we, we're developing a prototype at the moment that looks at the ecological footprint of our fish farmers, because a number of fish farmers are under for good reason are coming under uh, intense public scrutiny. And I think it's really important that we develop a system that measures the ecological footprint of each farmer in terms of you know, their input, the, their production system, the area coverage, the volume, et cetera, et cetera. And it will be able in the end of the day to be able to um, provide um, uh, a, a ranking of sort and also provide some advice in terms of you know, what needs to be done to minimize uh, and the ecological footprint of the fish and production system, but also um, an increased profitability. Another classic example, particularly because there's also another in growth, growing interest in nature-based solutions, which I'm very passionate about. And essentially what it does is all about aligning incentives and investments for sustainable production of aquatic foods. We worked on this for a long time, and essentially the concept is very simple. How do we reward good practice and disincentivize distractive or unsustainable practices? For instance, could there be a fiscal incentive mechanism where producers could be incentivized to change their behavior towards sustainability, for instance, for planting mangrove trees or for restoring coastal environments or for abiding with fishing restrictions, for instance, Similarly, could we use these incentives, for instance, uh, uh, a number of other fiscal disincentives to um, limit or to, um, to discourage unsustainable practices? But for me, the debate seems to focus on the legal versus illegal. There is so much talk about illegal fishing being a threat to all these nature-based solutions or sustainable management of natural resources, etc. But for me, it's the interface between the legal and the illegal, right? Fishing subsidies is a classic example. We give, in terms of billions every year, as capacity enhancing fishing subsidies. Essentially, we inject money to our big fleets to go out there and deplete the ocean. And this is a legal policy, by the way. This is a po legal policy instrument but again, it fuels the illegal fishing practices. 
inside the country, but also beyond as well. The reason why some fishing vessels are able to go hundreds or thousands of miles off their coast um, is because they are, you know, this is their cost, I mean, their revenue or their cost has been artificially suppressed or deflated and because of these injections in subsidies. And therefore, as much as we pay attention in the illegal fishing activities that happen, but also we need to talk about what are the legal policy instruments that enable them. And one of the most critical ones is uh, the fishing subsidies. Fishing subsidies is one of the critical issues in the WTO negotiations as we speak now. There is a, a ongoing debate about ending harmful fishing subsidies and it's part of the SDG if you look at target 14.6. And therefore, I think there is an urgency in scrutinizing not necessarily the illegal activities, but also our legal instruments that enable the illegal illegal activities, but also something that's uh, within our abilities to change as well, which is essentially eliminating harmful subsidies. And imagine um, uh, how much pressure on the natural resource will be alleviated as a result of just simply lifting uh, fishing subsidies. And as we know it all, more than a third of the fish or the seafood that's caught, aquatic food that's caught, is lost due to mishandling while being caught during harvest or post harvest. So an offload is uh, wasted. And what this means is that sort of a missed opportunity in terms of the nutritional value of the fish that we're harvesting, but also inefficiencies in our system, unnecessary greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, I think this is one of the issues that needs to be tackled and um, prioritized as well uh, as we strive to achieve um, a healthy ocean for healthy people and i think what it needs is that there needs to be access to technological innovations that would uh, eliminate or minimize um, food loss and waste and uh, we need to enhance access to market services a lot of fish is um, wasted before it gets even to the market because of lack of infrastructure uh, but also what's really novel is looking at, remember the problem I raised about aquaculture feed in Senegal. And imagine if some of the fish that's perished can be utilized uh, um, in producing feed for aquaculture fish, fish farms, um, or even sort of utilizing more broadly agricultural food waste as well. Um, and creating that circular economy. So, for example, in World Fish, we work in a number of other African countries who are using our cultural waste, such as uh, from cassava and a number of other uh, legumes and vegetables, etc., and utilizing that agricultural waste to produce uh, feed for aquaculture in a number of African countries as well. And this is really great contribution. The potential of uh, uh, the aquatic food system is honestly. A, Part of it could be also a solution to the broader um, agriculture food waste uh, uh, as well. So, but also, I mean, a simple techniques such as, you know, using sun drying techniques in Malawi, for instance, or, um, uh, you know, solar freezers in the Solomon Islands, uh, which are all sort of women led innovations here that have been promoted in a number of these countries. Um, yeah, and on the seaweed again, of course, there's a growing interest in the seaweed or what I call them sea veggies uh, because I love my seaweed and their ability to sequester greenhouse gas emissions, provide nutritious food and create employment income opportunities for many as well because they're very simple, they're not expensive, uh, they're fast growing, uh, but also very easy to harvest and then primarily they create a lot of job opportunities, potentially huge the opportunities for women uh, in coastal areas in particular. So to conclude, my key messages are the following. Realizing a shared blue prosperity for all through aquatic food systems is possible. However, I've just got these five points. Um, I just, including myself, I told myself the other day, I have to stop tinkering around the edges and focus on tackling systemic constraints. That means we need to beyond just the the fish or the, the the people in the fish itself but we need to look at the entire system such as you know the impact of lack of access to market nor market services institutional biases that we talked about earlier 
this chronic underinvestment that we see in the sector, et cetera, et cetera, are, all need to be looked at as well. Deploy at scale, best fit for context, technical and social innovations and market institutional, digital and nature-based solutions as well, as we discussed earlier. We need to align incentives and investments to nudge good behavior and let's tackle inefficiencies by eliminating food loss and waste and more importantly mainstreaming aquatic food systems in national or global policy instruments as well such as the national digestion plans etc et as well. Mm -hmm.